Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of the series where I show you how to build a working CPU in Factorio using belts. In part 1, I showed you how to build some basic combinational logic gates and a few of their applications, including performing addition and powering a 7-segment display. In this part, I will be building sequential logic components, including memory cells, and showing some of their applications as well, including a counter and a scrolling display. As always, the goal here is to build a computer by using the most basic technology possible in the game, that is, logistics technology, with only belts, underground belts, splitters, and inserters. Specifically, I will not be using any circuit network technology, like wires and combinators, because that would be too easy. As a quick recap, a belt without items on it represents an off signal, or a binary zero or logical false, whereas a belt with items flowing through it represents an on signal, or a binary one, or logical true. If you don't like the use of infinity chests and loaders like I do here, go ahead and watch the previous video where I explain how to convert these into a 100% vanilla design. So in the previous video, all of the circuits we saw had signals that flowed in only one direction, that is, from the input side to the output side. That's a key characteristic of combinational logic. In sequential logic though, we're going to have feedback loops with signals coming out from the output side being fed back as an input. So let's take the simplest example where we just have a standard NOT gate, except the output belt here gets looped back to the input. When there's a 1 here on the feedback loop, the input is 1 and the output is the inverse of that, which is 0. But then, we're going to have a 0 on the feedback loop, meaning the output will invert that again and change into a 1. Basically, if we leave the circuit alone, it's going to oscillate between 0 and 1 and 0 and 1 forever. Now, obviously a circuit that just oscillates on its own is not too useful, but it does illustrate some characteristics of sequential circuits. For all the combinational circuits we saw in the previous video, the output was strictly dependent on what input we provided. If we provided the same inputs, we could always expect the output to be the same. But in this case, even though we're not providing any input, the circuit can still output multiple values depending on its internal state. This is the key to building circuits that hold memory. The next circuit here is already a relatively popular one called an SR latch. If you look on the Factorio wiki, you can even find how to make one using circuit networks. Well, this is how you can do it using belts. It has two inputs, S and R, which stand for set and reset, and the output is usually labeled Q. The way this works is, if you turn S on, then the output turns on. That's pretty expected, but more than that, once the output turns on, it will stay on even if you turn S back off. Similarly, if you turn R on, the output will turn off, and it will stay off even if you turn R back off. If you look at how this circuit is built, it's just a NOT gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, plus a feedback loop. So the output is going to be the previous value at the output, and NOT R or S. If you read the formula, it basically says the output will be on if it was previously on and you don't reset, or it'll also be on if you just set. So already this works like a memory cell, because you can set or reset the circuit once, turn off the inputs, and it'll remember that value until you set or reset it again. But there are two disadvantages of using an SR latch. The first problem is, what happens if you turn on both S and R at the same time? For an SR latch, that behavior is not well defined. You could build it so that the output turns on in that scenario like what we have here, or you can make the output turn off, or you could even do something fancy like toggle the output, which makes it into a JK latch, but that's going to be more complicated and I'm not going to do that. The point is, you really don't want to have undefined cases like this in your circuit design, which could lead to unexpected behavior. The second and bigger problem is, there's no way to control the timing of this circuit. When you're building larger circuits, and especially a CPU, you're going to have signals feeding into each other and all affecting each other. If you don't synchronize everything, then the signals can easily arrive at the wrong time and interfere with each other instead. One thing you can do to improve on the SR latch is to combine the two inputs into a single data input and control the timing with an enable input, like this circuit here. The design is really simple, it's just a multiplexer. When the enable signal is zero, the multiplexer will select the top line here, which keeps outputting whatever the previous output was. And when the enable signal is 1, 
then the multiplexer will select the bottom line here and make the output equal to whatever you have on the data input. This design is called a D-latch. The way you would want to use this is, first, while the enable signal is off, set the data input to whatever value you want, then turn on the enable signal, When the circuit is fully stabilized, turn off the enable signal. Finally, once the enable signal is off, you can safely change the data input again without affecting the output. And you would repeat the sequence every time you want to lower the value into the D-latch. Now, this works pretty well on its own, but there is still a problem with this design, which is when the enable signal is on, the output will change continuously with the data input. There's no way to make the timing of output changes independent from the timing of input changes. Now why is that a problem? Well, think about situations where the data you want to load into the D-latch is a function of its own output. Or maybe you want a second D-latch whose data is a function of the previous output from this one. In those cases, not being able to decouple input changes from output changes is going to mess things up. And I'll show you an example of that later in this video. So that's what this next circuit is going to fix. This setup is called a master-slave-D flip-flop. That's quite a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it a memory cell. This is what I'll be using for everything that needs to store data from now on. Just like the D-latch, this has two inputs, an enable signal and a data signal. Except now we have two stages made up of two copies of the D-latch and a signal copier attached to each one. The two stages are called master and slave. The data input comes into the input of the master here, and this stage is activated by a copy of the enable signal. So if I turn the enable signal on right now, the input gets loaded into the master. The output of master then feeds into the input of the slave, which is activated by the inverse of the enable signal. When I set the enable signal back to zero now, the slave becomes active and sends its input to the final output. Let's do another cycle to really understand how this works. Right now the enable signal is zero, which means master is not active and slave is active. Because master is not active, it's not accepting new inputs right now, and it's only outputting the previously loaded value into the slave. The slave takes this value and sends it to the output. When I turn the enable signal on, it activates the master, but also deactivates the slave at the same time. Now master is accepting new inputs, which means I can load a new value into master, and it is going to send this value towards slave. But because slave is not active anymore, it doesn't take this value yet, and it still outputs the previous value. Finally, when I cycle the enable signal back to a zero, master becomes inactive and stops accepting new input, while slave now wakes up and takes its orders from the master, so to speak, and outputs the new value that was loaded into master. As you can see, this now lets us decouple the timing for input and for output over a full cycle of the enable signal. The enable signal here is also commonly called the clock. So when the specs for a CPU says it has a clock speed of 4 GHz, that means it operates with its clock signal going through 4 billion cycles per second. Whereas here, even with just a single memory cell, I can realistically only cycle the clock maybe once every 20 seconds, and that gives the circuit barely enough time to stabilize. This is already 80 billion times slower than a real CPU. Down here, I have a more compact version of the master-slave D flip-flop. It's just the same circuit, except rearranged a bit for space. Alright, with the components out of the way, let's look at some applications. The first one here is a counter, which just increments the output by 1 for each cycle of the clock. Right now the output is 0, and just watch me cycle the clock a few times. The counter circuit is made of three memory cells, one for each digit of the output, plus some combinational logic for figuring out what the output should be on the next clock cycle. If you're wondering what the other input is, it's a reset signal, which lets me quickly reset the counter back to zero. For reference, I've also built the same counter down here using simple D-latches instead of the master-slave D flip-flop. Remember with the counter above, as long as you give the circuit enough time to stabilize, 
you could cycle the clock at whatever pace you want. But here, if you leave the enable signal on for too long, all the latches here will be constantly enabled, and the output will keep feeding back into the input and keep producing new outputs, and this cycle will continue beyond your control. Also, all the belts can be of different lengths too, so after a while, everything will fall out of sync and you end up with a giant mess. Hopefully this makes it clear why the master slave version is used. Finally, the second demonstration I've prepared for you today is this. Let's just watch it in action first. I'm not even providing any input here, the circuit is doing all the work by itself. At the top here, I've built an oscillator with a sufficiently long cycle to act as the clock, so I don't even have to manually toggle any inputs. The clock signal goes through a bajillion signal copiers, because this signal needs to be fed into every single memory cell in the entire circuit. The right half of the circuit holds the data for what we want to display. Down here, we have a programmable array, just like what we had for the 7 segment display. It might not be obvious, but if you look at the pattern of where the lines are disconnected versus where the lines are joined with OR gates, you can see the pattern encoded in here. On top, we have a series of memory cells daisy-chained in a row. This one here currently holds a value of 1, and it is causing the array to output the pattern for this column. With each clock cycle, this one is going to travel down the chain one column at a time and activate each column in sequence. That's how it produces the entire pattern to be displayed. Technically, instead of using a chain of memory cells, I could also use a counter and a binary decoder circuit to achieve the same thing, but that would have been much more work to build. Now the left side here is the memory for pixels in the display itself. It's made entirely of memory cells and signal copiers. The rightmost column here receives its data from the logic array, which is the data for the next column to be displayed. Each row of memory cells here is also daisy-chained with each one feeding into the one to its left, so all the values will shift left by one column with each clock cycle. The output of each of these memory cells is simply copied and sent directly down here to light the pixels. This entire field of memory cells holds data for 30 pixels, which is less than 4 bytes of data. Compare that with a modern RAM module, which can easily hold 4 gigabytes of data, which is about a billion times more. I hope you enjoyed this video. Now we have all of the basic components that we need to start building a functional CPU. Next time, I will be building a basic arithmetic logic unit, which is the core component that performs calculations in a CPU. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think, and see you next time.